Hi everybody, Dr. Ellis here. In this short video, we're going to talk about the kind of blood cells known as leukocytes, or white blood cells. When we talk about leukocytes, again, white blood cells, we're talking about the kind of cell that are involved in immune reactions. As you can see from our picture over here, there are many different kinds of leukocytes, and they each have different functions. But big picture, all of them are involved in keeping you safe and healthy. When we talk about the way that leukocytes work, they travel through the bloodstream, but then they go to the site of the infection or the place where your tissue has been damaged, leaving the bloodstream to go start that immune reaction. So keep in mind, in normal circumstances, you'd find them by those erythrocytes, the red blood cells, but when they need to cause an immune reaction, they're actually gonna leave those blood vessels to do it. When we talk about leukocytes, there are a couple of different things we can use to identify them. So the first thing we can use to help us identify each type of leukocyte is their nucleus. When you look at the shape of the nucleus of each of these different types of cells, it's different. And that helps you to identify uh, which kind you're looking at. So notice here with a neutrophil, there's lots of little parts to its nucleus. Whereas with a lymphocyte, for example, there's one big circular nucleus. Or a monocyte has this big, almost kidney-shaped nucleus inside of it. So different shapes of nuclei can help us identify each of the types of white blood cells. Some of those white blood cells have what we call granules. And granules are little spots. So when I look at the granules, uh, only three of my, my leukocytes have these granules, but the color of those granules can help me to identify them. So when we look at an eosinophil, this is going to have bright red dots, bright red granules. When we look at a basophil, that has dark blue granules. And in a neutrophil, the, the color of the granules is kind of a neutral, in between red and blue, so it's like a light purple color. So as you're working on identifying the different types of cells, especially in lab, keep in mind that we have two ways to figure out what we're looking at. Number one, what does the nucleus look like? Number two, what color is that cell? So we're gonna start by talking about the cells called granulocytes. Granulocytes is just a fancy word for saying this is a kind of cell that has those granules. It has those spots. There are three granulocytes when we're talking about white blood cells. We have neutrophils, eosinophils, and basophils. And notice again from my picture, you can see those dark blue spots, those bright red spots, or kind of this fuzzy light purple color here when we're looking at the neutrophils. Study pro tip, we must know that these three types of white blood cells all fa fall under the category of granulocytes. All three of these have those little granules. So let's go through and talk about each of these types of cells one by one. We're gonna start with the neutrophils. Neutrophils get their name because they, start, uh, they die, die with a, a dye that is neither basic nor acidic. It's a neutral dye. So the dye that they stain with uh, they don't stain very well and when they do it's just kind of light pink or purple neutrophils get their name based on that. When we think about neutrophils, the first thing I want you to think about them is these guys are the first on the scene. So when your body detects that there is an invader or when your body detects that there's been tissue damage, the first kind of cells that are gonna help respond to that are neutrophils. When they get to the scene, when they start responding to it, they'll begin an inflammatory response, meaning they'll begin that uh, attraction of other cells there. Basophils are a lot better at inflammation, but neutrophils start it because they're the first on the scene. The other thing that neutrophils do is they're really good at fighting bacteria. So if you have a bacterial infection of any kind, there's lots of neutrophils on the scene taking care of that. The way that neutrophils deal with bacteria is something called phagocytosis. So phagocytosis, it, think of it kind of like eating. We're literally taking something inside. So what a neutrophil does is it goes to the site of a bacterial infection, it eats the bacteria, and once that bacteria is inside of it, 
it's going to use the hydrogen peroxide that's inside its granules to destroy that bacteria. So first granulocyte, neutrophils. They don't stain very well, they're kind of light pink purple. They are the first cell on the scene and they're really good at killing bacteria. The next kind of granulocyte are the eosinophils. Eosinophils get their name because they stain with a dye called eosin. So eosin is an acidic dye. When a cell takes it in, it looks bright red. So eosinophils, my bright red cells, named after the eosin dye that they dye with. When we talk about eosinophils, the primary thing that they're elevated in are in parasitic infections. So this is things uh, like parasitic worms or blood-based parasites. The way that eosinophils deal with parasites is by spitting out those red granules. Those red granules then will attach to the surface of, of the parasite. That's going to flag that parasite uh, for the immune system, but more importantly, it's also going to break that membrane down to weaken the parasite. The other thing that eosinophils can actually be involved in is allergic reactions. Now, I wanna put a caveat with this, that eosinophils are not the primary cell involved in allergies, uh, but they can also contribute to that. Fun fact, Dr. Aulis has some food allergies that manifest as issues with my eosinophils. So when I eat a food that I'm allergic to, what happens is my eosinophils run to my esophagus and make my esophagus swell. So I have something that's called eosinophilic esophagitis. So my particular kind of allergy involves the eosinophils, but for the most part, your general allergic reactions, that's gonna come down to these last guys, the basophils. So when I talk about basophils, my last granulocyte, these get their name because they die with a basic dye. Basophil basic. What I want you to know about this basic dye is that it, it has dark blue granules. So the, the color that we see of their polka dots, dark blue because of the basic dye. When we think about basophils, let's underline highlight star that they release histamine. Histamine is one of the biggest things we're gonna know basophils for. And if you've ever taken an antihistamine for your allergies, that's a great way to remember what basophils do. So histamine is the chemical that's best at triggering inflammation. This inflammation uh, means that an area is gonna get warm, it's gonna get red. All of that happens because there's more blood cells coming to that area. So histamine causes your blood vessels to get wider, bringing more blood to an area. And as the blood is uh, going to that area, we're also specifically recruiting other white blood cells to respond. The other thing that I mentioned, and let's underline, highlight, star it, is that basophils are really the allergic reaction cell. So like I mentioned, you can take an antihistamine for your allergies. You're literally trying to act against what these basophils are doing. So let's recap so far. Basophils, dark blue, they spit out histamine, which is involved in inflammation and allergic reactions. Eosinophils, these dye bright red, their primary function dealing with parasites. Neutrophils don't dye very well at all, but they are the first on the scene for allergic reactions and they are really good at taking care of bacteria. These are my three white blood cells that do have granules, they're granulocytes. Let's shift gears and talk about the things called agranulocytes. Agranulocytes just literally means no granules. A is without. So now we're gonna talk about the white blood cells that don't have those spots. For each of these types of white blood cells, let's underline and highlight star this statement right here. Each type of A granulocyte has to be activated before it's going to be able to do its job. So those cells that we were talking about before, the neutrophils, uh, in, in the case of monocytes, they're gonna actually be an activator as well. 
So the other types of cells that we talked about, the granulocytes, start an alert, a, a response, an immune response, that will end up activating these other types of cells. So the first type of agranulocyte for us to be familiar with are called monocytes. Monocytes start with that kidney bean looking nucleus, but as they're activated, they go through a differentiation process where they become a macrophage. Now remember with neutrophils, we use that word phagocytosis, which meant to eat something. That's the way that monocytes, as they differentiate, as they become these macrophages, that's what they do. They eat things, phagocytosis. The purpose of monocytes eating things is to allow them to activate the T and B cells. So T and B cells are my really specialized types of agranulocytes. The way that monocytes activate them is by first eating that pathogen, that bacteria, that virus, whatever it is. Then they take those antigens, they take the things on the surface of that invader, and they present it to the immune system. So by presenting them with, with the signals that tell us this is an invader, my B cells and my T cells can both get activated to cause a specialized immune response. So let's talk about these two types of lymphocytes that are involved in those specialized responses. T lymphocytes have a variety of different functions because they can differentiate into many different kinds of specific T cells. So we're not often just gonna talk about T lymphocytes. We're gonna talk about things like T helper cells. T helper cells help an immune reaction occur. So their job is to spit out chemicals called cytokines that help to bring other immune cells over to the area. So increasing an immune reaction using cytokines, that's my T helper cells. We also have cells called cytotoxic T cells. Cytotoxic T cells specifically target cells that are infected with a virus. They also can target cancerous cells. Like their name suggests, cytotoxic T cells will actually kill cells that are either infected with a virus or cells that are cancerous. So cytotoxic T cells, really good at killing things uh, like viral infected cells or cancers. There's also what are called regulatory T cells. And when we talk about regulatory T cells, these are the kind of T cells that regulate the immune response. Once you've written this word end in the blank there, I want you to underline highlight star before normal cells are damaged. Before normal cells are damaged. The purpose of regulatory T cells is once we've dealt with the virus, the bacteria, the cancer, we wanna stop that immune reaction. Regulatory T cells help us to do that. So these are the three primary functional T cells that we have. I'll mention that for right now, I'm not gonna ask you to know the specific receptors that are found on each kind of cell, but I showed you this picture to highlight the fact that what a T helper cell responds to is different than what a cytotoxic T cell responds to. And my regulatory cells that I see over here are listening for some of the same kind of messages that the other types of T cells are. One last type of agranulocyte to mention, and these are the B lymphocytes. B lymphocytes are always going to differentiate into what's called a plasma cell. So a plasma cell is the kind of white blood cell that makes antibodies. Antibodies are proteins that float around in your bloodstream and their goal is to attach to the pathogens. So viruses, bacteria, whatever it may be. Antibodies do several different functions. First thing they're going to do is attach to those, those pathogens and neutralize them. Essentially, if I cover you in my antibody proteins, you won't be able to do your normal infection thing. You're blocked from that. But those antibodies also do what's called agglutination. Agglutination means those, those pathogens are sticking together. If they're sticking together, they can't evade the immune system as well. They're an easier target. And the final thing that these antibodies do is a process called opsonization. 
obstinization is kind of like um, like a flag. So when I put a flag on the outside of you, when I obstinize you, the rest of the immune system will be able to see you. They'll be able to, to phagocytose you or, or cause that cytotoxic T reaction. Ultimately, all of these steps activate something that we'll talk more about in the immune system, something called complement. So complement is a series of protein chemical reactions that increases the immune response. So B lymphocytes, primary function, making antibodies. I'll mention though, that you can see from my picture here, once a plasma cell has made some antibodies, we also see the formation of something called memory B cells. A memory B cell is what our goal is when we do vaccination. We want to create a cell in your body that can really quickly make antibodies if the flu virus or the COVID virus gets into your body. So not only do we make antibodies in the moment, but we also make cells that could make them again later. One, oh, uh, one little cartoon here that might help us out with remembering who does what. My B cells that make antibodies, they look like the letter Y up here. Their job is to protect us for things that are outside the cell. Those T cells that we talk about their function is specifically cells that are already infected with something. So a slightly different response with these two types of lymphocytes. One last note about these white blood cells. When we're talking about the different types of white blood cells, we often use a thing called colony stimulating factors to help these, these different cells develop. Now, when we're talking about the types of, of white blood cells we have in the body, Remember that some of our white blood cells came from a myeloid stem cell and some of them came from a lymphoid stem cell. We're really good at understanding how myeloid stem cells become their specific type of white blood cell. So we need to know about these things called colony stimulating factors. Think about colony stimulating factors as a specific message that tells you exactly what I want to build. So we have what's called monocyte colony stimulating factor. Unsurprisingly, that's going to tell my stem cell, hey, let's make me some monocytes. We also have what's called granulocyte colony stimulating factor. Granulocyte colony, uh, excuse me, colony stimulating factor is what allows us to make granulocytes. So remember, granulocytes have granules. They might be neutrophils. They might be eosinophils, they might be basophils. All of those are made in response to GCSF, granulotype, granulocyte colony stimulating factor. We don't necessarily know what specific chemicals lead my lymphoid progenitor cell to make a B cell or to make a T cell. Or remember, we also have that one called the natural killer cells. We don't know like we know with these colony stimulating factors exactly what leads to this differentiation. So make sure we know with the lymphoid types of cells, make sure we know what those can develop into to make our white blood cells.